Thank you so much. God bless you. Well, I want you to know it is my privilege to be here today, and I mean that. I, I'm honored to be in your church. I'm happy to be back in this place and see what God is doing. And I've been knowing your pastor for a long time, and I've got some really good stories on him. How many of you would like to hear some? <laughs> yes. Another time, perhaps, right? And I, I'm happy to be here today, happy to have my daughter Morgan with me, traveling with me this weekend, and just glad to see what the Lord is doing in this place. I know many of you are visiting today. I'm a visitor as well. To be honest with you, I don't know who the visitors are and who the home folks are, but I'm glad all of you made it. And I'm praying that the Spirit of God will speak to my heart and speak to your heart. And with that in mind, I want you to take the Word of God with me and turn in the New Testament to the little book of Colossians, if you will, to Colossians chapter number 1. And we're going to read a few verses together, and then I'm going to bring you a one-word sermon some of you are saying, praise God. We've been praying for one of those. <laughs> but don't get too excited because it's an amazing word. It's going to take me a few minutes to explain it. It's actually found not once, not twice. It's found three times in Colossians chapter 1. Now, I don't know how it was in your home growing up, but at our house, when Mama said it once, I was supposed to listen. When she said it twice, I was really supposed to listen. When she said it three times, it was too late to listen. How many of you understand what I'm talking about? Not good. When God says something repeatedly, it is not because he forgot he said it the first time. When God repeats a word and the Holy Spirit inspires it for a man to write down, it is because that is a word God wants to put deeply inside of us. And when I'm done this morning, you're not going to remember me, and that's all right. And you're not going to remember my outline and much of what I say. But I want you to remember one word. When you leave here, I hope you'll not only take the word with you, I hope you'll take this particular thing with you. Look at me at Colossians chapter 1, beginning in verse 1. The Bible says, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, and Timotheus, our brother, to the saints and faithful brethren in Christ, which are at Colossae, grace be unto you and peace. From God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, we give thanks to God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you. Since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love which you have to all the saints, would you stop just for a moment and back up and notice, please, all of these pairs that are found. For example, look at verse number 1. Who's writing? Paul, and he has with him a young man by the name of Timothy. In verse number 2, he gives the geographical location and the spiritual location of those he's writing to. He says they're in Christ, but they're at Colossae. I might say this, you are in Christ, but you are at Pinecrest. You are in Christ, but you are at McDonough. Look at me, please. Geography may change, but if you know Christ is your Savior, your position in Him never changes. Every week of my life, I'm in a different place. I wake up some mornings and wonder what state I'm in. The geography's changing all the time. But this is wonderful. At this moment and tomorrow and the next day and the next and the next and the next and the next, I am seated with Jesus Christ in heavenly places. Somebody says, will that ever change? The only way that's ever going to change is someday my body's going to catch up with my spirit and I'm going to be with him forever. So he gives both locations. And then notice the two things he prays for them. Grace and peace. How many of you would like peace? <laughs> Let me ask you this way. How many of you have watched the news in the last 24 hours? How many of you would like peace? It's what we need in our homes. It's what we need in our churches. It's what we need in our communities. It's what we need in our nation, in our world. And notice the divine order. You don't get peace first. You have to get grace first. You don't get peace without grace. You have to experience the grace of God. And once you've experienced His grace, peace is the byproduct of the grace. It's not the goal. It's the byproduct. And then look on. He does two things for them in verse 3. He thanks God for them, and he prays for them. And that is Paul's right now and say, I thank God for you. I thank God for a church in this community lifting up Jesus Christ. I, I thank God there's a place you could come on the Lord's Day, hear the Bible preached and fellowship with God's people. I thank God when I walked through the door this morning, I sensed the love of God in this place. That's wonderful, isn't it? But I'm not just thanking God for you, I'm praying for you. And I want you to know at this moment, Jesus is praying for you. At this moment, the Son of God, seated at the right hand of the Heavenly Father, He's praying for you. 
And notice the two that give these gifts. In verse number 3, the Bible says, God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I love that. May I tell you that every good and perfect gift comes down from above from the Father of lights in whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. But look at me just a moment. You don't get it because you deserve it. You get it because of Jesus. It comes from the Father and it comes through the Son. And then notice this little pair in verse number 4. He said, we heard of two things. We heard of your faith and we heard of your love. And I love the divine order. It doesn't start by loving one another. We're trying to get a whole world of people to love one another again. Let me just tell you, that's not going to happen apart from Jesus. You have to have faith in God before you ever have love for anybody else. They asked Jesus, what's the greatest commandment? He said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, all your strength. And the second is likened to it, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Look at me. You cannot obey the second commandment without obeying the first. And so I'm sorry to tell you this, but it doesn't start this way. It starts this way. And with that in mind, I bring you to our verse and I bring you to our word. It is the garden in which all of the other grows. It is the root of which grace and peace and every beautiful thing is the fruit. It's found in verse 5. For the hope, the hope which is laid up for you in heaven, whereof you heard before in the word of the truth of the gospel. And here's the word. It's the word hope. Would you take out a pen if you have one, and would you circle the little word in your Bible in verse number 5? It's the third word in this little verse. When I stop, say it out loud. Would you please? For the what? Hope. Come to verse number 23. If you continue in the faith, grounded and settled, and be not moved away from the what? And notice again, it's not just any hope. It is the hope of the gospel. In verse 5, it is the hope that was found in the word of the truth of the gospel. In verse 23, it is the hope of the gospel which ye have heard and which was preached to every creature which is under heaven. Come to verse 27. To whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the what? The hope of glory. I noticed this morning no one knew what I was preaching today. But I noticed this morning in the Scripture reference that we read from 1 Peter, the last phrase we read was this phrase, that your faith and hope might be in God. And I tell you, our world is in desperate need of hope this morning. As a matter of fact, hope seems to be in short supply. Every 38 seconds in our beloved nation, a teenager attempts to take their own life. We're going to have a lot of those young people from our area in this auditorium tonight and you know what we're going to offer them one thing hope in jesus christ that's it and i gotta tell you it's the only message i have today i i didn't come to entertain you i didn't come to make you feel good i have nothing good to share with you but one thing and that is the hope that is found in the person of jesus christ did you know suicide is up 300 percent from my daddy's generation 300%. We are the most drug generation in the history of the world. And I watched this week as politicians debate and talk about the opioid crisis and what are we going to do? How are we going to fix all this? Look, you can't fix any of that until people find the only true source of hope. You know what everybody in the world is looking for? You know what people in this room are looking for this morning? I'm going to tell you why people got out of bed this morning and came. I don't know how you got here. Maybe you got here because your spouse just nagged you to death till you finally came. And maybe you got here because your mom and daddy said, you're going whether you like it or not. That's the kind of home I grew up in. Maybe you're here because a friend invited you. Maybe you're here because you think it's the thing to do. I don't know why you're here. But I'm going to tell you why you're really here. You're here because somewhere down deep inside in every one of us, there is a hole that only Jesus can fill. There is a vacuum, there is a longing for something that is greater than anything this world can give you. That's why you're here. And I I meet people everywhere I go that seem so empty and they're searching for something. It's funny, isn't it? We all kind of follow the same pattern as King Solomon. 
You remember when he was young and in love, he wrote a book called The Song of Solomon. He started with a song. He started in love and he started excited and he started with much hope for his future. And somewhere along the way, something happened. And when he writes his last book as an old man, it's the book of Ecclesiastes. And he has to say, all is vanity and vexation of spirit. How do you go from the love and the joy and the peace and the excitement and the hope of youth to the utter emptiness and disillusionment of old age? I said to somebody this past week, a friend of mine, I said, you know, I meet so many unhappy old people. I mean that. And for the record, I don't want to be one of them. I don't want to come to the end of the journey and think, what was this all about? Full of regret, full of hopelessness. And let me just say to you, I'm not here for my health this morning. I actually believe it is possible to have a Song of Solomon heart in an Ecclesiastes world. And the whole world may be empty and broken and hopeless and helpless and unhappy. But you hear me, please. If Jesus Christ, the Son of God, lives inside of you, none of that has to be true of your life. There is hope, and it is found in the person of Jesus Christ. I read an article the other day, and the title of the article was this, Death by Despair. And I thought, what an apt summary of the world we're living in where people are, are grasping for something, reaching for something, looking for something, standing on the shores of time and reaching for as much sand as they can, but the tighter they squeeze it, the more of it sifts through their fingers until they reach the end and say, there's nothing here, nothing worth living for, nothing to look forward to when I die, nothing of hope. Now, I'll tell you what the devil does. He brings lots of cheap substitutes. I got an idea. Everybody needs hope. Let's get the government involved. How many of you know that's not going to fix it? It's never God's desire that government bring hope. Somebody else says, so maybe the pleasure of this particular thing, if I, if I get a new thing, if I buy that, if I have a, have a raise this year, a bigger house, a nicer car, newer clothes, a longer vacation, that'll fix it. No, it won't. No, you're going to be as hopeless at the end of that as you were at the beginning, if not worse. And some people think another human being can do that for them. So they look for some man, some woman, somebody different. Surely they can make me happy. Hear me, please. It was never God's desire for Adam to make Eve happy or Eve to make Adam happy. There's not a sinner on earth that can give you what only Jesus can give you. And the great need in every one of our hearts is one thing. It's hope. Now I want to show you this hope this morning. Oh, by the way, did you notice anything? You English and grammar teachers are going to love this, and I'm sorry to the students who are already trying to recover from last week, but did you notice the definite article? Did you notice it doesn't say hope? It doesn't say a hope. It says what? The hope. Look, there is only one hope. His name is Jesus Christ. Look at the three occasions with me. I'll show you something interesting about this hope. Number one, look at verse number five. The Bible says the hope is laid up for you in heaven. Somewhere in the margin of your Bible, would you write this down? Number one, my hope's in heaven. <laughs> Somebody says, what does that mean? It means it's not here on earth. And let me just bust your bubble for a second. If you spend your life setting your hope on things here below, you are going to be one disillusioned human being. Hope in some person, they'll disappoint you. Hope in yourself, you'll disappoint you. Hope in things or in circumstances or in situations. I have no doubt in my mind there's some people in this room right now, all is going well. Congratulations. Enjoy it while you can. But if you set your hope in those circumstances and think it's going to be like that forever, my friend, someday you're going to wake up and be a very disillusioned human being. And the truth of the matter is, even if you could live your whole life and all the circumstances were favorable to you, when you come to the end of this world and you stand face to face with God Almighty, on that day, nothing on this earth will substitute for the hope that is found only in Jesus Christ. And I'm testifying. I love my family and I love our life and I love our home. But my hope's not in any of those things. My hope's in heaven. 
It's interesting, it's a banker's term that he uses. You see it in verse number 5? He says it is laid up for you. It's like somebody depositing something in a bank. Do you have a bank account, a savings account, checking account? You say, yeah, there's not much in it. No, but you've got one, right? And when you choose a bank, you choose a bank that's insured. You choose a bank that is secure. You choose a bank because you think my money's safe in that bank. Listen to me. There's not a bank on earth that can give you what only the bank of heaven can give you. And I want to say to you this morning, the hope that is found in Jesus Christ is not found here below in those you see. It is based in one you cannot see. It is secure in heaven. And by the way, hallelujah, that Dow never dips. That NASDAQ never changes. That stock market doesn't ride up and down like a roller coaster. It stays the same every day because our God never changes. My hope is not here. My hope is in heaven. On April the 14th, 1912 at 1140 at night, the ship that God himself could not sink, they said, cut through the icy waters of the North Atlantic, hit a huge iceberg and cut open several watertight compartments in a matter of moments thousands of people were perishing the titanic went to the bottom of the ocean only 306 bodies were discovered imagine that only 306 194 of them were identified one of those bodies on april the 23rd was labeled, they hung a little marker on his foot. They didn't know his name yet. They just put the number on him. He's number 174, just a number. But he wasn't a number. He was Robert Bateman. And Robert Bateman was a Christian. Now, you've never heard of him. You don't know him. He was a famous man, but he knew Jesus. The amazing thing was, just about a day or two before the Titanic had its fateful, tragic accident, Robert Bateman sat down in his little cabin and took out a piece of stationery and a pen and wrote a letter to his nephew, Tom. He was already on board the ship, and they were sending post off of the ship, and Robert's letter made it off ship before the accident. In a couple of weeks after the Titanic went to the bottom of the Atlantic and a couple of weeks after Robert Bateman's body was discovered and identified, Tom strolled out to his mailbox one day and opened it up to find a letter from his Uncle Robert who he had just heard had died. He opened it hurriedly and read these words. Dear Tom, I'm enjoying immensely my time on the Titanic. It's an amazing ship. It's wonderful. But I want to tell you, if this ship goes to the bottom of the ocean, I shall not be there. I shall be up yonder with Jesus. And I want to tell you what that is, friends. That's hope. And I want to say on the authority of the Word of God this morning, if the whole world falls apart tomorrow, if everything the predictors and prognosticators say is true and worse, if America comes apart at the seams, if the world is in total upheaval, if everything I've loved and enjoyed disappears in a moment of time, if the whole ship goes to the bottom of the ocean, I shall not be there. I shall be up yonder with Jesus Christ. And I say to you this morning, you do not need some earthly hope. You need heavenly hope. Look, please, do you see this dot? Pardon me. Do you see this dot? That's your birth. Do you see this little line right here? That's your life. And you see this dot? That's your death. Let's review. Here's your birth. Here's your life. Here's your death. Somebody said, that's not long enough. The Bible says we get the span of a man's hand, so that's what you got. Here's your birth. Here's your life. Here's your death. Watch. And here, here's eternity. By the way, how far would you like for me to go? <laughs> if I ran around your building a hundred times, it'd be fun to watch, 
but it would still be an imperfect illustration because there is no end to eternity. Now, wait a minute. If that's true, I want to ask you something. Why is it we put so much of our hope in this and so little of our hope in this? What you see and what you experience at this moment is not going to last very long, but heaven is going to last for all eternity. Are you ready for heaven? Is your hope there? And the second truth I want you to see, it's in verse number 23. The Bible says, let's just back up. Let's start in verse 20. And having made peace through the blood of his cross. Oh, I love the song about the cross today. By him, that's Christ, to reconcile all things unto himself. By him I say, whether they be things in earth or things in heaven. And you, you that were sometimes alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now hath he reconciled in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and unblameable and unreprovable in his sight. If ye continue in the faith grounded and settled and be not moved away from the hope of the gospel. Somewhere in the margin of your Bible, would you make this note? My hope is not only in heaven. Number two, my hope is in him. Who's him? Jesus. Would you look at him on that cross? Taking a holy God in one hand and unholy humanity in the other. Look at him. Taking the righteous one in one hand and unrighteous ones, that's us, in the other and making a way so that hopeless, fallen humanity could have hope again. You see, my hope is not just a place. My hope's a person. For the record, when I say my hope's in heaven, may I just tell you, I'm not just talking about the city. I'm talking about Christ. What makes heaven heaven? Jesus. Not walls of jasper and gates of pearl and streets of gold and mansion. No, look, that's not what makes heaven heaven. Jesus makes heaven heaven. And I say to you that the same one that will make heaven heaven is the same one that will make hope real right now where you are. Only Jesus. I sat there a moment ago and listened to the song and I thought of the verse, there's none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. The pastor of this church has a good name, and I'm glad that his name won't save you. And the name of the evangelist won't save you, and the name of your family won't save you, and the name of this church won't save you. But the name of Jesus has power in it. And when you put your faith in Jesus Christ, he comes to live inside of you, as we'll see in just a moment. He alone brings that hope. Matter of fact, let me show you something. Hold your place here a second. Just put your hand here. Turn back to Romans chapter 8 with me for a minute, would you? I was reading this week just devotionally through the book of Romans, and I, I came to Romans chapter 8. Now, we know Romans 8. It's a famous chapter. It has that great verse 28. We know that all things work together for good. To them who love God, to them who are called according to his purpose. That's a very hopeful verse. But look at verse number 24. For we are saved by what, church? Huh. But hope that is seen is not hope. For what a man seeth, why doth he yet hope for? Interesting how many times in that one verse, the word hope is used four times in one verse. It almost sounds like this is one of the great principles God wants us to learn. What is this hope? Let me tell you what it's not. If I use the word hope today, I mean it as a wish. For example, I hope I have a good meal later. Some of you are already thinking about your meal, so let's just get to the subject, right? I hope the preacher doesn't preach all morning long. How many of you have that hope? Thank you for not raising your hand. I appreciate it. In other words, we mean this is my wish, my desire. Look at me. That is not the Bible word hope. The Bible word hope is not some fanciful children's storybook. I hope this all works out in the end. That's not the Bible word for hope. The Bible word for hope is a word of certainty. It is a word of confidence. It is a word of expectancy. Look, please, it is another way of saying, I believe it. And I'll tell you why. Because my hope is not rooted in things that change. It is rooted in the one who is the same yesterday and today and forever. How many of you have lived long enough to know life changes? 
Our bodies change. Amen? The bank account changes. Our kids change. Our oldest is with me today. She's a senior in high school this year. I'm not ready for this. But life is changing. I'm going to tell you something that helps me. In a changing world, there is one who never changes. And on the mornings, I get up and don't feel good. And on the days, nothing goes right. And on the nights, I hit my head on my pillow, and I think, I really blew it today. That day, Jesus was the same as my best day. You see, my hope is in him. About, I don't know, 60 miles from here, something like that. A little over a year ago, I preached in a meeting, and it was an evening service. We had a sweet service. Really, it was a sweet meeting. People come to the Lord, and it was late, and the preacher said, would you like to get something to eat? And I said, sure, we can get something. And we found the only restaurant in town that was still open. <laughs> as a matter of fact, we walked in as they were getting ready to close, and we kind of apologized. We're sorry. And we sat down over in the corner of the restaurant, and the young waitress came by and took our drink order, and when she did, I could see it on her countenance. It's been a hard day. She came back, brought our drinks, and asked if we were ready to order, and we said we were. And I said to her, I said, long day? She started chuckling. She said, oh, it's been a rough one. I said, we're going to try to end it good for you. We'll be really easy. We'll be quick. Get out of here. No problem, sir, no problem. She took our order, and she came back a few minutes later. And providentially, I really believe this, providentially, she knelt down beside our table. She was tired. She knelt down beside our table, and she had brought some things, and we were just chatting with her for a moment. And I said to her, I said, are you from here? She said, no, sir, I'm from, and she said, a certain part of Atlanta. And I said, I know that area. And I said, what brings you here? And her eyes filled with tears. She said, a new start. I said, you have children? She said, I have one little boy, and she said, I'm raising him by myself. And she said, to be honest with you, sir, we've had a hard time. And she said, we moved up here just hoping maybe we could start over. I looked at her, and I said, do you really mean that? She said, yes. I said, you mean you actually think it'd be nice to start over? She said, absolutely. And I said, that's interesting. I said, because there was a man that came to Jesus one night like this. It was dark outside. Nobody was around. And he was looking for the same thing. She said, is that right? I said, same thing. She said, well, what did, what did Jesus tell him? I said, well, I'm glad you asked. I said, Jesus told him the only way he could have a new start was he had to be born again. I said, you ever heard that term born again? She said, yes, sir, I've heard it. She said, but I don't really understand it. I said, well, let's make it real simple. It's a new start. It's new life, but wait, it's not physical, it's spiritual, and it happens the moment you invite Jesus to come into your life, and you don't turn over a new leaf, and you don't create the new life, and you don't make a new start, and you don't pull yourself up by your bootstraps and make it happen. No, Jesus comes in, and he makes the new start. She looked at me, and she said, that's what I've been looking for. And do you know, kneeling beside that table in that restaurant late that night, that young woman bowed her head and trusted Jesus as her personal Savior. I wish you could have been with me. I mean this. I wish you could have seen the change in her countenance from the time we went in to the time we went out and her saying, oh, thank you. Thank you so much for coming. This is wonderful. This is the greatest day of my life. What, what does that? Now, we tipped well, but no tip does that. Let me tell you what does that. Jesus does that. Because our hope is in him. Oh, but here's the grandest thing. Did you come to the third verse, to verse 27? To whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is, what is the glory of the mystery? Which is Christ. I love it. Don't you love the Bible? Christ what? In you, the hope of glory. 
Would you write down a third thing in the margin of your Bible? My hope is in heaven? Yes. My hope's in him? Yes. But thank God, my hope's in my heart. Watch this. My hope is not future, it's present. It's not distant, it's near. You see, some people, some people think of hope as, well, yeah, way back yonder somewhere, I made a decision as a child and, and I prayed a prayer and I got baptized, so that's my hope. Wait a minute. God is not a past tense God. I mean, some people say, well, I'm just muddling through life, just enduring to the end, hoping it all works out, and when I get to heaven, maybe we'll understand it all. You ever hear people talk that way? Like their hope is future. Wait a minute. God's not a future tense God. Do you remember what God called himself in Scripture? He said his name is the great what? I am, which means that God is present where you are right now. And hope is not a memory, and hope is not a future event. Hope is a present tense salvation being lived in your heart at this moment if Jesus lives inside of you. And here's the beauty of this hope. The moment you invite Christ to come into your life, the creator God of the universe, (laughs) the one who said light, and there was light, and it was very good, comes to move inside your house. How many of you would like God to go home with you today? Christ in you. The hope of glory. And I want to ask you a personal question right now. Is he in you? Can you with confidence say at this moment, Christ, the Son of God, lives inside of me? Can you say that? Several months ago, I was preaching in a a church in Parkersburg, West Virginia, a beautiful auditorium filled with people, and I finished my message. And I gave the invitation, and To be honest with you, I didn't think there were many people there that day that were not believers. When I started the invitation, a fine, well-dressed businessman on this side of the auditorium, five or six rows back, in a nice business suit, meticulously dressed, stood to his feet. I still remember. He buttoned his coat. He grabbed his Bible. He had a Bible cover on, little Bible study pens and highlighters. I mean, he looked like the epitome of a Sunday school teacher. He was the first man to leave his seat, come down the aisle, and the pastor met him at the front. I saw both of them begin to weep. They sat down in the front row, and I finished my part of the invitation. When I did, I gave it back to the pastor, and this is exactly what he said. He said, everybody knows, brother, and he said the man's name. Everyone nodded their heads. He said he's been a trustee in this church for the last 10 years. He said, but he's come forward this morning to say, that he really doesn't have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. And today, he wants to be saved. At the end of the meeting, I was standing in the lobby of that church, and people coming by, and that man came to me, a man probably in his 60s, I would say, and put his arms around me. I never met him before in my life, stranger. Oh, but a brother now. He put his arms around me, and he said, Sir, He said, all these years I've been here in this church and going through motions, and he said, but I've never really had hope. And he said, today I'm leaving with it. Christ is inside of me now. Take a trip with me, would you? Got to go back in time, 2,000 years. It's going to be quite a trip. And halfway around the world, there are two men. Can you see them off in the distance? Two men. And they're walking, talking, cheerful. And both of them are carrying something. They both have a little, a little scroll, it seems, to be rolled up. Letters. One of them, his name is Tychicus. They're walking along a little dirt path. Where are they headed? Hey, fellas, where are you going to? Colossae. Really? Quite a city. Oh, yes. What are you going there for? See the sights? No, no, we're not interested in that. We've seen all that before. No, there's a, there's a group of people there that are followers of Jesus. And a preacher by the name of Paul, he's, he's written them a letter. A letter to the church at Colossae. We can't wait to get there. This Sunday, they're all gathering in a certain house, and we're going to read the letter to them, and they can't wait to hear it. Well, that's interesting. 
Well, there's another fellow walking with him. What's your name, buddy? Almost ashamed to tell you, maybe you've heard of me. My name's Onesimus. Onesimus, Onesimus. I've heard that name. I've heard of you. It hit the papers. You ran away, didn't you? Took some of your master's things, ran off to Rome. They looked for you for months. Onesimus hangs his head, yes, sir, that's me. And what are you going back for? You know the law. They can put you to death. You're going to go back where you ran away from? Yes, sir. Why? Well, something happened in Rome. What happened? Well, I thought I'd get lost and nobody had known me, but it seems like God knew I was there. And I met the same guy, this preacher named Paul. He told me about Jesus. And I came to know Christ. Well, what are you carrying? Well, I got another letter. It's different. But see, our church in Colossae meets in a guy's house. His name is Philemon. And Philemon was my master. And I can see Onesimus unrolling that little scroll now and tears streaming down his face. He points and says, look here. Look what Paul wrote. Paul wrote to my master that I was one of the family now. I wasn't a slave anymore. And that if I owed anything, he'd pay it. And he wants Philemon to receive me back home just like he'd receive the Apostle Paul if he were here. What do you think of that? That's pretty good. True story. For Tychicus and Onesimus carried two of Paul's letters on the same journey to the same town, and I love this. One was a declaration of hope. We now call it the book of Colossians. We read it this morning. But the other is an illustration of hope. It's called the book of Philemon in your New Testament. And it is the story of how one's man, one man's life was changed forever and he went from hopeless to hopeful because he met not Paul, but because he met Jesus Christ. By the way, into eternity, every man carries a letter. I want you to look me in the eye for just a moment, every human being in this room. Someday, you're going to leave this world. Watch, please. You're going to take one step out of this world into the next. And when you do, you're carrying a letter. And your letter is either going to say, paid in full. Or it's going to say, payment required. And you choose which letter you carry. And I came this morning to plead with you two things. Number one, make sure the hope is in you. And number two, if it is, would you please share it with somebody else? Because out yonder in Rome, there's an Onesimus who's hurting and searching and lost. And his only hope is to meet Jesus Christ. Because the only hope is found in him. Father, I pray this morning that Christ will do what Christ alone can do in this moment. And fill our hearts with faith and hope. Spirit of God, do your work. Our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed, and I'm going to ask you to sit very still and quiet for just a moment. And I'd like to ask a question or two, and I, I'm going to urge you to please be honest because God already knows the answers, and it's dangerous to lie to the God of truth. How many of you know for sure if in the next 60 seconds you met God? If you knew 60 seconds from right now you were going to stand face to face with Jesus, you can honestly say, preacher, I'm ready. I know I put my faith in Christ, repented of my sin, and taken Jesus as my only Savior. And if I died in the next 60 seconds, I know my name's written down in that book in heaven and Christ lives in me. I know what you're talking about. That's reality for me. I want you to raise your hand high in the air with mine. Keep it up just a moment, only if you can with confidence. With your hand raised to heaven right now, would you thank the Lord for that? Just right where you sit. Would you just praise him for a moment and say, thank you, Jesus, that I'm never going to hell. Thank you for the blood of Christ. Thank you for dying for me. What a Savior we have. What a wonderful Savior. Bless his holy name. You may lower your hands. 
Now, some of you couldn't raise your hand with confidence. Now, I want to thank you for not lying. I mean that. It's dangerous to lie to God, dangerous. And I'm going to ask you to tell the truth again. No one else in this room is looking. And I'm going to give you my word. I'm not coming to you. It's not my way. I'm not interested in embarrassing anybody. I'm not going to make a spectacle of you. I promise you. But I want to pray for you this morning. It's why I came. How many people in this room would honestly say, Preacher, if I met God in the next 60 seconds, I don't know for sure. I'm not sure that my sins are forgiven and that heaven is my home and that I'm ready to meet God. But I know this. I'm sure I don't want to go to hell and be separated from God forever because of my sin. Preacher, you're talking to me right now. I need that hope you're talking about. When no one else is looking, I want you to raise your hand as high in there as you can get it with mine right now. Would you please? I see you. Thank you. I see you. God bless you. Who else? Pray for me, preacher. Thank you, ma'am. I see you. Who else? Raise it up. Pray for me, preacher. God bless you, sir. I see you. You say, I need this. I need Christ in me. Here's what I want to do. Please listen with your heart. I want to give you an opportunity right where you sit to call on God and ask him to forgive your sin. See, it's not between you and a church. It's between you and Jesus. I'm not your priest. Jesus is the only priest. You've got to go through him to get to the Father. And he said, him that cometh to me, I will in no wise cast out. Let me tell you what that means. It means if you'll take Jesus right now, he'll take you. Would you be willing to put your faith in him? The Bible says, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Would you like that? You're a whosoever, aren't you? Then would you be willing right where you sit this morning to call on the name of the Lord and ask him to be your personal Savior? Would you pray in faith and ask him to come live in your life and forgive your sins? I'll tell you what he'll do. He'll take every question mark and make it a period and an exclamation point. The doubts can go. The uncertainty will go. And you can leave today with confidence that you belong to Jesus and he belongs to you. Is that what you want? If it is, whether you raised your hand or not, right where you sit right now, I'd like to lead you in a simple prayer, a prayer that you can make your own and pray from your heart to God. And I want to ask every man, every woman, every boy, every girl, every young person in this room right now that's not sure they're saved, if you would right now where you are, pray with me and personally invite Jesus into your life. Would you pray something like this from your heart to God quietly right now? Would you just pray, dear God, Right now, dear God, I'm a sinner. On my, on my own, I cannot get to heaven. But I don't want to go to hell. I believe that Jesus died for my sins. I believe that he rose from the dead. And I invite you to come into my life right now and be my personal Savior. Forgive all of my sin. Give me a new heart and eternal life. Make me a part of your family this morning. Thank you for dying for me. Thank you for giving me hope in Christ. Help me to live for you from this day forward. Now, our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed and no one's looking but me. The Bible says, whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. I believe that. If I gave you a million dollars this morning, you wouldn't be ashamed of it. You'd be excited about it. Well, friend, if you just ask Jesus to be your Savior, you got something better than a million dollars. you got eternal life. You can never spend that up. And I don't think you'll be ashamed of it. And I'm going to ask right now on the count of three, all of you that prayed and asked the Lord Jesus into your heart this morning to be your personal Savior, to let me know by raising your hand so I can pray for you and rejoice with you. And if this morning, right where you sit, you're trusting Christ and you invited the Lord Jesus into your life to be your Savior, on the count of three, I'd like for you to raise your hand and let me know. One, two, three. Quickly and quietly right now. Would you raise it up? Would you get it as high in there as you can, big and high so I can see it? I'm looking. God bless you and you and you. I'm looking. Keep them up. And you, and you, and you. Praise God, I see you, and you, and you. 
Who else? Now, I want every one of you that just raised your hand to lift your head and look at me for a moment. Nobody's looking but me and you. I just want to talk to you like I sit in your living room. In just a moment, I'm going to invite believers to come and have a prayer in this altar. Just come and kneel or stand here and have a prayer. And here's what I'd like to ask. There were about nine of you that prayed, invited the Lord to be your Savior. I am thrilled for you. I want to be the first to congratulate you. I'm happy for you. It's great. Your name has been written down in heaven. Christ came to live inside of you. And I'm going to give you my word on something. I don't even know exactly how they normally do it here, but we're not going to make you give a speech this morning. And we're not going to make a spectacle of you. But do you see these men standing here all along the front, the pastoral staff? They're here because they love God and they love you. That's what this day is all about. That's why it's called Friend Day. When people are coming forward to pray, I'm going to ask you to leave your seat and not come forward and kneel and pray. I'm just going to ask you to leave your seat and just come shake one of their hands and say to any one of them, I prayed that prayer and asked Jesus to be my Savior today. However you want to say it, I got it settled today. However you want to say it, but I'm going to ask you just to tell one of them so that they can have a brief prayer with you and then we'll let you go back to your seat. But we want to rejoice with you in your decision today for Jesus Christ. And here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to begin a prayer in a moment. When I end my part of the prayer, I'm not going to say amen because I'm not stopping it. I'm just starting it. Here's my invitation. I'd like for everyone to look at me for just a moment. How many of you know the Lord is your Savior? Would you raise your hand? And some of you can raise your hand now, but couldn't a minute ago. Isn't that a glorious thing? Here's my invitation. See, some people come into a service, they think, well, that's for somebody else. Now, come on, we've all done it. I'm glad she's here this morning. She really needed that. Boy, he needed that sermon. No, no, no. God's truth's for every one of us. So here's what I'm going to ask. I'm thinking about the service already tonight, frankly. And I'm thinking about this week, your church being out in the community. And I'm thinking about these special days where you're trying to evangelize this city for Christ and the difference this church could make. And here's my invitation. I'm going to ask how many of you Onesimuses out there would be willing to say, with God's help, I'm going to take the hope that's been put in me this week and I'm going to try to share it with at least one other person. You can't tell everybody, but you can tell somebody. And if you will, and if you're physically able, I'm going to ask you in a moment to find a place to tell God. And many of you want to come and just kneel or stand here along the front and have a prayer. Wonderful. Some of you may want to just pray at your seat, especially if you're not able to move well. That's fine. But I'm going to ask you to join me in a prayer that God will help this message go beyond this hour. Wouldn't that be nice if it didn't dead end at 1130 and we all go home and say, well, that was nice. No. Let's take the message. Let's carry the letter. Let's tell hurting people in our room about the only hope found in Jesus Christ. And I want you to pray for those who've trusted Christ today as their Savior.